Hi, welcome back to Psychology as a Human Science here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the second one in a series of, I think, three uh, that will focus on humanistic psychology. In the previous video in this series, we took a look at humanistic psychology's historical emergence, and then we characterized its basic movement in terms of holism, and we went into some detail about what holism is. So, holism would be the first general way of characterizing what humanistic psychology is, but in this video I want to talk a little bit about uh, the second dimension, and then talk a little bit about uh, the research approach that derives from it. So the second dimension is going to have to do with a very recurrent insistence on exploring the meaning of experience. Okay, so the basic datum, as it were, of humanistic psychology, for the most part, is going to have to do with how we experience different things in our lives. And of course, humanistic psychology is going to be oriented around trying to explore and reveal the psychological meaning of how we experience different things in our lives. Could be something clinically oriented, like how what the experience of major depression or anxiety or schizophrenia is like. Or it could have to do with everyday type experiences, like who knows, maybe uh, the experience of being a student here at West Georgia, you could explore the psychological uh, structure of that kind of experience or the experience of, um, you know, uh, being uh, playing a sport, let's say, you know, and having a great day, being in the zone in your sport, that could be explored. But at any rate, the emphasis is going to be on experience and revealing the psychological meaning of experience. So, how does humanistic psychology do that? Well, one of the main ways is by way of what's known as qualitative research. Okay, so qualitative research. Now, the word qualitative kind of has the word quality in it. I think we talked about this a little bit before in one of the earlier videos. So don't be thrown by the fanciness of the word, nothing like that. What it means is research that's oriented around exploring the quality of something, and of course in this case it's going to be the quality or qualities more commonly of how people experience different things in their lives. So qualitative research as it's, as it's approached from the point of view of humanistic psychology is going to have to do with exploring the qualities of how we experience different things in our lives with an eye toward revealing the underlying psychological structure or meaning of that. Okay, so qualitative Research. Let's see how I said it in your notes to touch base with your notes. A qualitative research method is one that focuses on the qualities of things. In this case, the qualities of people's experiences. It usually has to do with interpreting people's written and or spoken descriptions of their experience. Okay, so this is worth taking a couple seconds to make note of. Qualitative research for the most part focuses on the language that people use to describe their experiences. Okay, so uh, the basic datum is not going to be numerical in nature. Okay, we touched on this in a previous video. It's not going to be quantitative in nature. It's going to be qualitative in nature, exploring the qualities of experience, and usually uh, what that boils down to is interpreting how people describe in regular natural languages. Natural languages means languages that people actually speak and use like English or whatever, you know, Urdu or Serbo-Croatian or name your favorite, Cantonese or something, you know, so a language that people actually use as opposed to, I don't know, Esperanto perhaps or a computer language like a like C-sharp or something like that. All right, so um, uh, people's written and spoken descriptions of their experience and its goal is to produce a written articulation of the psychological meaning of those descriptions and experiences. Then the next little segment we've already said, it focuses much more on words and language than numbers and equations. And uh, I think that's probably pretty obvious by now. Consequently, qualitative research is usually not experimental in nature. Now when I say the word usually, occasionally there will be a kind of experiment going on that's qualitative in nature. Like they'll, uh, you know, maybe ask someone to get into a sensory deprivation tank and, and have that kind of experience and then describe it afterwards. So there's a kind of element of experimentation in there, but not in 
usually in the formalized sense, in the natural science sense of experimentation. So uh, I said this in qualified ways. Uh, in fact, there's a bunch of qualifiers in the next several segments of your notes. So qualitative research is usually, but not always, not experimental in nature and is usually, but not always, not conducted in laboratory settings. You know, maybe, maybe one time in 10 or one time in 20, it's experimental and laboratory driven, but it, that's, that's definitely the exception to the rule for sure. So, um, here at West Georgia, most of the research is qualitative in nature, um, even when it's not being done specifically under the purview of humanistic psychology. So here I have to ask you to remember uh, the whole business of human science psychology, how that's like a superset, and within that superset there's one element known as humanistic psychology and there's several other elements a bunch of other elements, for instance, there's going to be phenomenological psychology, existential psychology, discourse analysis, critical theory, and so on. There's a bunch of different elements within that. Humanistic psychology is just one. But even when uh, those other elements get involved that you'll be hearing about later this semester, the research is almost always, again, qualitative in nature, and only occasionally is it quantitative in nature. So uh, you won't hear a whole lot of the language of mathematics and more specifically statistics here in the program of West Georgia. You're going to hear a lot more about qualitative research methodology and that sort of thing. Okay, so there are many specific ways of conducting qualitative research. Okay, it depends on sort of the paradigm and from a phenomenological point of view, there's going to be a, a kind of specific paradigm from the point of view of uh, discourse analysis. There's going to be a specific way of conducting qualitative research and so on down the line. Okay, so there's not just one master way of doing this is the big point. Okay, so uh, that's, you know, sort of qualitative research in a nutshell. What's the main point of this? The main point is that you start to pair in your mind this uh, humanistic psychology and this business of conducting qualitative research. Okay, so that those are sort of linked in your mind and especially the idea that for the most part, not always, but for the most part, humanistic psychology is going to be emphasizing qualitative research and it's going to focus on examining people's everyday experience of life with an eye toward revealing the psychological meaning or structure of it. And if you could say that sentence, that last sentence, or understand that last sentence, that means you're starting to get in good shape for the first test in this class. So that's a good sign. All right, the second thing I wanted to talk about in this uh, video with respect to humanistic psychology that's very characteristic of it is something that I think I mentioned uh, in the last video in our initial characterization of it, and that is it tends to place a lot of emphasis on the theme of potentials, human potential, and entering into our potential, and uh, sort of striving for our deeper possibilities in life. Okay, That's not necessarily true of most mainstream psychology, and I'm laughing a little bit because it's, it's, I'm understating it, really. It's, it's rarely the case that in mainstream psychology they're going to be exploring this to any uh, deep degree. So. All right, so a big emphasis on human potential. Now, I wanted to trot out right off in the beginning of this a vocabulary phrase that's very common way of talking about this within humanistic psychology, and it's there in big capital letters in your notes, and it's the phrase, dramatic pause, self-actualization, <laughs> okay, to heighten the drama of the moment. So um, self-actualization, which is uh, a way of describing the process of glimpsing and ultimately living out our deeper potentials and possibilities in life. Okay, so by the way, you know, actualization, that may seem like a long and slightly intimidating word. It should not, because actualizing just means to make something actual, to make something real. Okay, so the whole idea behind self-actualization is to glimpse something inside of yourself, right? Of all the possibilities you could possibly live out in this world, there would be something like a relatively small subset of that that resides within your being 
that would be something like the deepest, most powerful, most interesting life you could possibly live, the most interesting variation of yourself you could possibly become in this life. Okay, so self-actualization is about seeing that and then making it real in the concrete moments of your life. Actualizing means making it real. Okay, to, and so self-actualization, once again, let's, get, let's connect the dots a little bit to help you understand, is about glimpsing and making real the deepest, most interesting, most powerful, most luminous possibilities that are running through the fabric of your being that you could possibly live out in this lifetime. Okay, so <laughs> in case you need a new hobby, you know, I don't know, maybe you get tired of stamp collecting or something like that. Like, like, what's your new hobby? Oh, you got a new hobby. Like, I haven't seen you for a while. You get into a conversation with a friend, old friend or something. Like, oh, you got a new hobby. Yeah, it's self-actualization. Wow, that sounds like kind of cool. Like, what is that about? Well, it's about glimpsing and ultimately realizing the deepest possibilities inherent in my unique and distinct form of human existence. <laughs> How have you been? <laughs> right? So, um... Okay, so here's another way of describing it. Uh, another, like if you were to sort of describe self-actualization from a slightly different perspective, how we can learn to pass beyond the conventions and habits <laughs> that normally keep us constricted and living lives that are much smaller than they really need to be. How it is that we settle. So it's about passing beyond the temptation just to settle in your life. And, and here's the trick of it. It's like we settle in all kinds of like tricky, subtle ways that we aren't even necessarily aware of at first. Okay, it takes an awakening process to, be, to become aware even of how you are deflected away from your deeper destiny in this life and are continually deflected away. And a lot of it happens by way of social dynamics. So, you know, a common thing uh, for young people, let's say you're about let's see, in this class, like 19, 20 years old, something like that, you know, um, probably, so you're just coming out of your adolescence and you're taking the first steps into adulthood and all of that. Well, most of us do that uh, with the uh, whole bunch of ideas that we've been told, uh, you know, you've been told how you have to think mostly by your parents, but also by the larger society around you, by TV and whatever, the internet and, <laughs> you know, sort of all kinds of social dynamics implicitly tell you how you have to be, how you have to think, how you have to feel, what beliefs are the right ones, what attitudes are the appropriate ones, you know, like all of that kind of stuff, what values you need to have, how you have to see things, like what you have to believe, what your religious uh, convictions have to be, like what your uh, sexual orientation has to be, and all the way down the line. Like most of us arrive in adulthood with a whole lot of baggage that way. Now some of that baggage is maybe your own, right? And maybe, but probably a lot of it is just stuff that other people have heaped upon you. And, and the process of early adulthood, part of it's about like starting to recognize like how much of that baggage you're carrying around is really just your attempt to live other people's lives for them, right? Like to live out your parents' lives for them, to live out your parents' values for them, to live out the larger society's uh, belief systems for it, right? So it's a it's a sort of challenging process to, to sort of look deeply enough into yourself and see that, oh man, I'm, I'm carrying around like a bunch of baggage. Some of it I don't mind carrying around. Some of it may be good, but probably a lot of it isn't. Probably a lot of it you're just like working like hell just to be the person that someone else wants you to be, okay? To live the life that someone else wants you to live and not necessarily your unique and distinct deepest possibilities and destiny in this world. So it's a, you know, part of self-actualization has to do with a kind of sculpting away process, like sculpting away all of the sort of seductions and deflections and the, the easy, cheap answers and, you know, all the, all the sort of ways you end up avoiding your deeper destiny. Okay, so it, it involves passing beyond the conventions and habits that define, quote, normality. All right, so, you know, if you're going to live an extraordinary life, you're going to have to be more than normal. Sorry, I apologize on behalf of the universe for your having been born into it in the form of a bipedal mammalian creature walking around with a deeper destiny. But that's the way it is. So, uh, passing beyond 
things that would keep you constrained and imprisoned and living a life that's not really your own. You know, and if I'm t if starting to terrorize you in this lecture, good, <laughs> because you know this is a terroristic process. Like it is a terrifying thing to realize that oh, you know, I'm starting my adult life, and like a lot of the main direction isn't really me living the life I want. It's me trying to live the life that someone else wants me to live. You know, whether parents, uh, you know, professors, we can be in the circuit too. Like so often, like students are so eager to please whoever, whatever authority figure is around, like living the life that your professor wants you to lead. The point of your existence is to actually lead your life, not someone else's life, okay? You're not born here to be a clone or a robot or a damn puppet dancing on the strings of someone else's values and habits and beliefs and all of that. Like you're not here to worship at the temple of someone else's hollow tin gods. Sorry, but the challenge of life is way deeper than that. It's not as trivial as that. Your soul is way deeper than that. You are not a trivial soul. Sorry. God, your life would be so much easier if you were just a shallow, trivial, uh, superficial soul, but I don't think you are. Don't think you are, okay? And it may seem like you are, but if it seems like you are, maybe that's because you're just starting the adventure we're trying to outline, okay? The adventure of self-actualization. And uh, needless to say, self-actualization also means starting to live with courage, all right? It takes a lot of courage to break away from other people's desires. It takes a lot of courage to be willing to disappoint other people in order to be true to yourself and to be true to your deeper destiny in this life. That takes a hell of a lot of courage. Okay, so if it's a tough challenge, if you're finding like, well damn man, like you're outlining a tough challenge today in this video, it's like, hell yeah, yeah buddy, this is a tough, tough challenge. This is not an easy thing for anyone. And if you think it is, you probably haven't seen deeply enough into it yet. Okay, so, oh, damn man, starting to sweat early in the morning here, all right. What is that, a donkey? Oh, that's me. All right, so the point is not <laughs> to live merely an okay life, but to, to, to see if you have enough courage to live a truly extraordinary life. And if you think that, well, I can't possibly do that. I'm not constructed that way. I'm not born that way. Well, I think you might be wrong about that, actually, to just sort of cut to the chase. Like, I would invite you to question whether that's really the case or whether that thought itself is just another way of being deflected away from your deeper destiny. Maybe that thought that you're incapable of this is just another piece of baggage that you're carrying around that you've been told is what you're about as a human being, but that it's not even close to being accurate. <laughs> Just a weird thought, okay? So uh, the point of your existence is to see how extraordinary you can be, how extraordinary you can make your life, you know, how you can possibly ride that ever cresting wave of human existence that is crashing on the shores of this world moment by moment in the form of your own unique and distinct participation in human existence. Okay, so, damn, I bet that's something you don't get told that often. God, I wish someone told me that when I was 19 or 20 or thereabouts, but I had to sort of learn it on my own. But, <laughs> giving you the shortcut, all right? So, the point is to live an extraordinary life as, as uniquely deep and uniquely powerful as you can possibly make it. And that is a huge, big theme in humanistic psychology. Okay, so I wanted to end this video here because I think it's a natural break point. And like I said, I wanted to sort of have, uh, I didn't want to make one massive video that you got lost in. I want to keep them small, relatively bite-sized, easy to digest and assimilate by you, the tuition-paying West Georgia student. Anyhow, I hope you have a great day. Uh, so we'll end this video here. And uh, in the next video, we'll take up some names and some big ideas within humanistic psychology. Until then, take care of your soul. Bye-bye.